Straight to the market action of the day, it was a quiet day on the Lal Street, which saw consolidation as markets await inflation data. The range-bound session saw the Sensex, Nifty and Nifty Bank end flat, but with a slight negative bias, but mid-caps fared slightly better. Our big focus, retail inflation eased in the month of uh, October, but remained above the RBI's tolerable band for the 10th consecutive month. The CPI came in at 6.7% with vegetables seeing the sharpest drop. Ekta Batra joins us now to decode the numbers. Ekta, what are the big trends that you're seeing? Well, yes, the CPI data for the month of October came in at a sub-7% figure but was in line with estimates. It came in at around 6.77%. Our poll was expecting 6.73% and this is versus 7.41% in the previous month. This, in fact, is the lowest figure that we've seen since the month of July. Now, in terms of uh, the components, all of the components have shown a lower inflation rate as compared with September. The base impact was actually one of the main drivers for the inflation rate this time round. So the food inflation softened to around 7.01%. Versus 8.6% on a month-on-month -month basis, we had vegetables which softened to around 7.7% versus 18% in the previous month. Fuel and life, light inflation which was sub 10% at around 9.9% versus 10.4% in the previous month. Core CPI came in a tad above what we were expecting. It came in at around 6% versus a poll of around 5.9% and versus 6.1% on a month-on-month -month basis. Now, in terms of what the experts are expecting from the Reserve Bank of India when they meet in December is that, yes, they will probably continue to hike rates, but the quantum of the rate hike is probably expected to be lower. Will the RBI stick to its inflation forecast of around uh, 6.5 percent for Q3 of FI23, 5.8 percent for Q4 of FI23, and 6.7 percent for FI23 as a whole. The expectation is yes, this inflation target should be met by the Reserve Bank of India. Right, uh, so that was an update uh, on the G20. And staying with the G20, the Prime Minister has arrived in Bali for the 17th meeting of G20 leaders. He would be meeting several world leaders. At least eight bilaterals are expected during his three-day visit. The Foreign Secretary, Vinay Kumar Quatra, had said that Prime Minister would be participating in some key sessions such as food and energy, digital transformation and health. The Prime Minister is also expected to participate uh, in a visit to the mangrove forest that is being organized by the President of Indonesia, Joko Widodo. This is a symbol of G20's commitment to fight climate change and the climate crisis. The Prime Minister will also be addressing the Indian community in Bali tomorrow, that is the 15th of November. And uh, this is a very special meeting of the G20 because Indonesia will be handing over the presidency to India during the closing ceremony on the 16th of November. Let's move on to a CNBC TV. Time now for, a, for another CNBC TV 18 exclusive. LinkedIn CEO Ryan Roslansky says that they do not have plans to lay off employees. However, he says that a freeze on hirings has been implemented across several departments. Here's a slice of that exclusive conversation with uh, CNBC TV 18's managing editor, Shireen Pan. I think that as long as, you know, at LinkedIn, we have principles around our talent strategy, our strategies are always moving around. We have no plans. Uh, we haven't announced anything um, as it relates to uh, any kind of layoff or, you know, kind of across the board for our company. We, do, we have put ourselves inside of a, a hiring freeze right now for various parts of the company. But again, like every other leader, we're just continuing to navigate the global strategy that we need to keep the company going to create this platform that so many people are finding value off of right now. Now to an important story for taxpayers especially. We're learning from sources that the union government will seek more disclosures from taxpayers, NRIs and startups from the next financial year. NRIs may need to disclose details of remittances received from India. They may also need to disclose the nature and address of their business connections in India. Meanwhile, startups could be asked to disclose details with respect to the registration with DPIIT. The big story from uh, the IT space, LNT Infotech Mindtree merger comes into effect following approval from shareholders and regulators. The merged entity, LTI Mindtree, is India's fifth largest IT services company.
News from the aviation sector now. Promoter of the winning consortium for Jet Airways, which is Caldrock Capital, has been in the spotlight. This after reports on raids on entities linked to the promoter in three different countries emerged last week. Caldrock Capital has confirmed these investigations but says they won't impact the acquisition of Jet Airways. Madhiha Mujawar joins us with more. Madhiha, what do these uh, uh, raids really tell us and what is the company stating to you? Well, the news about raids on properties linked to Calrock Capital's promoter Florian Fritsch came out last week on the 10th of November. Now, Calrock Capital has confirmed that regulatory agencies in three countries, which are Liechtenstein, Switzerland and Austria, are investigating certain businesses where Florian Fritsch is a financial investor in his personal capacity. Remember, Calrock Capital is one of the partners in the Jalan Calrock Consortium that won the bid to revive Jet Airways. This news has added more uncertainty to the proposed relaunch of Jet Airways, which looks unlikely this year. Remember, the consortium is yet to make payments to lenders and employees of the erstwhile airline. Reports have suggested the raids are in connection with suspected fraud and money laundering. However, in the statement I received, Florin Fritsch says these investigations are commercial in nature and not criminal and won't have any impact on the acquisition of Jet Airways. He is also saying that neither Calrock Capital nor Jet Airways have any connection with the ongoing investigations. All right, thanks uh, very much, Madhya, for joining us. Let's now speak about the India-UK FTA. Remember, there will be conversations around this when Prime Minister Rishi Sunak sits down with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Speaking to CNBC TV18 today, the UK ambassador to India, Alex Ellis, said there's a clear route seen for a great FTA summit and UK would like to now start working on core issues in the FTA talks, which includes tariffs on goods, services and also protecting UK investors. Let's listen in. Well, I think a lot of the groundwork has been done. So what will those issues be? They'll be around the relative lowering of tariffs. Um, you know, on, uh, India has very high tariffs traditionally, uh, border taxes, the UK has very low ones. But you know, both have products which they'd like to be able to sell more into each other's markets. Then there's a question of services. Uh, uh, India, UK is very open in terms of service economy. India is more closed. Will India open a little bit more? I suspect in return, India would say, well, we want a bit more access to work routes for Indian workers to the UK. UK will ask for uh, ensuring that there's proper investment protection for UK investors into India. Uh, I think that should be to India's advantage because India, in order to make this huge economic transformation in the next generation, needs a lot of investment. So uh, the British government has ordered the extradition of both those individuals, in the case of Vijay Malia now almost two and a half years ago. Um, that's as far as the government can go. Then there are processes through the courts which have to be followed. The courts are obviously independent from the government and those are going on at the moment. Uh, all I would say is the wheels of justice turn slowly, but they do turn. And Prime Minister Boris Johnson, when he was here, made clear that in general, we do not want uh, economic fugitives in the United Kingdom. All right, uh, Wizards of the Lal Street now, a special CNBC TV 18 show. And uh, today we had uh, Ramesh Damani on the program, and he said that people have moved on from gold, prefer betting on reality. Let's listen in. If I want to ask you about Nifty from here, 20,000 first or 16,000 first, what would be your answer? Uh, the higher one. Taiwan. Oh, yes. wow. Okay, that's uh, bullish, Ramesh Tamani. Absolutely. Uh, technology stocks or PSU stocks? What do you prefer? Actually, like both the groups, but right now I'm more invested in PSU stocks. Okay. You want to leave wealth for your next generation or you prefer they earn it on their own? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> one. <laughs> Watch what you say. Yeah, I, I know. I think my grandchildren will be watching me. Uh, I think we should leave something for them uh, because, you know, they should know their grandfather, uh, but not so much that they don't want to do anything with their lives. So I would hope they would have productive lives and would also have that ambition to earn money uh, because uh, it's, you know, it's the ambition of a young man and it should be the ambition of a young man to earn his wealth, to see how he stacks up in the world. So. You know, hopefully you'll give a lot of philanthropy, but also give, leave, leave some for the grandchildren. Gold or real estate, the asset class that you prefer, apart from equities, of course? Uh, probably real estate. Uh, you know, gold is, uh, I mean, Sonia, inflation last year was at 40 years high, 8%. Gold was down 10%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that tells you something that people have moved on from gold. Your big investment bet for 2030? 
You know, my big investment call or bet is that if you remain invested, you will compound money. All right. Rapid fire with Ramesh Damani on Wizards of the Talal Street. Moving on now, time for a short break, but coming up on the other side, a special story on how school teachers are coping with keeping students of corner now. Arundhati Ramnan joins in with all the action from the startup space. Arundhati, take it away. Thank you so much for that. Here's all the action from the startup world. Amazon's founder, Jeff Bezos, says he will donate most of his money to charity. In an interview with CNN, Bezos has been facing criticism so far for not signing up to the giving pledge. Unlike other billionaires, his now-divorced wife, Mackenzie Scott, has been on a charity spree, having donated more than $12 billion to over 1,000 organizations in just the last year. Elon Musk's rocket company, SpaceX, has bought an advertising package on Twitter for its satellite internet service. The social media platform has reportedly been seeing an exodus of advertisers since Musk became the owner and CEO. Now, Twitter generated over 90% of its revenues in the second quarter from advertising sales. Back home, fintech SaaS startup Lentra scoops up $60 million in a Series B round led by Bessemer Venture Partners and the SIG Venture Capital. Now, City Ventures also participated in the round. The fresh round values the company at over $400 million. Electric mobility startup Yulu bags $9 million from the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. The investment is a part of the U.S. government body's focus on financing clean transportation solutions in emerging markets. Meanwhile, Paytm CEO Vijay Shekhar Sharma assures shareholders in a letter that the company is on the right path to profitability and free cash flows. Paytm posted an increase of nearly five times or 387% in loan disbursements in October to 3,056 crore rupees from a year ago. With that, it is back to you. All right, thank you very much for the startup snapshot, Arundhati. Let's uh, move on and get you a special report now. Billionaire wealth saw a rapid rise soon after the COVID-19 pandemic. But as 2022 rolled in, most of this wealth has been wiped out. Kiran Khatri reports on the swings in the fortunes of the world's Richie Rich. The world's 10 richest men doubled their fortunes in the first two years of the COVID pandemic. That's according to an Oxfam report released in January this year. The pandemic also created a new billionaire every 30 hours. However, for these billionaires, 2022 has so far been a terrible year due to the Ukraine war, soaring inflation, recession fears and sell-off across equities and tech stocks in particular. Let's start with the world's richest person, Elon Musk, who recently took over Twitter. Amid his multiple U-turns on the acquisition, Musk's fortune has fallen by around $82 billion to below $200 billion. Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg's fortunes have also taken a hit of around $70 to $80 billion each this year as the stocks of Amazon and Meta have been in free fall. The fate of China's wealthiest tycoons hasn't been very different, especially due to a massive market sell-off over President Xi Jinping's third term. Bottled water billionaire Zhang Shanshan's fortune has slumped by nearly $13 billion in 2022. Meanwhile, L'Oreal's Françoise Bettencourt Myers has seen her net worth fall by nearly $22 billion this year due to COVID curbs in China, the brand's key market. Moderna CEO Stefan Bansell and Zoom CEO Eric Yuan's wealth multiplied at a fast pace due to COVID, only to plummet even faster. Their net worths have dropped by a whopping 65% and 82% since their peaks during COVID, and the loss continues. But the most significant loss in terms of percentage has come from the crypto space. FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried was still a billionaire last Monday. By Friday, his entire fortune was wiped out as his company filed for bankruptcy amid a liquidity crunch, and he quit as CEO. The crypto crash has another casualty. Binance CEO Zhao Changpeng lost over $77 billion in wealth this year with Bitcoin staying below $17,000. However, the richy rich in India have been largely unaffected by global uncertainties. Gautam Adani's net worth has grown by more than $61 billion this year and Mukesh Ambani's net worth has also jumped by over $2 billion. In Mumbai, Kiran Khatri. All right, uh, let's move on now. It's been almost a year since physical schooling restarted, but the effects of the pandemic on the Indian schooling system and on the psyche of students, especially in primary classes, have left some deep scars. On Children's Day, CNBC TV 18's Jacelia 
and Arundhati speak to counsellors and child psychologists to find out how schools and students are really coping. For over two years, students and teachers only met online for a few hours a day. And the lack of physical interaction took a toll on students, especially in primary classes. They were very distracted. Attention was very less. To grab their attentions, there were several attention grabbers which were created so that children pay attention. It is of different size, small. Though physical schooling restarted over a year ago, getting children back to their daily schooling schedule continues to be a difficult task and holding children's attention is often a challenge. Many experts say this is because of a greater exposure children had to screens during the lockdowns which spanned over two years and weaning them away from these screens has not been easy. Many children have presented with a variety of symptoms, from social anxiety to irritability to a lack of focus to even signs of depression. They became irritable, they have become moody, they were anxious. So these are all some of the factors which really the internet had uh, the other, uh, I mean, uh, worst side of internet. Students who were from the younger category, they had more problems to settle in, but they were the ones who settled in very easily as well because uh, they enjoyed over here and the kind of uh, curriculum our kids basically has. The transition was a little tough, but with time and with a lot of activities which were planned, uh, I think they got a very good break uh, from technology that they were using for a very long period of time. Uh, and younger students took more time to adjust as compared to older ones. This is a magnesium reaper when we born. In India, educational institutions were the first to go into lockdown and the last to come out of it. And this has come at a steep cost. Matters, experts say, were not helped when parents gave children greater access to various devices to keep them occupied or distract them from being cooped up indoors. A research report by the University of Calgary estimates that globally, screen time among children below the age of seven rose by over 50% from pre-COVID levels. This report also points to several unfavorable correlations between increased screen time and mental health, including depression, insomnia and inability to concentrate and anxiety. Experts say more ill effects may surface soon. For more children getting into an autistic behavior, we may see more number of children becoming uh, attention deficit uh, children. Maybe, we, because they're all long-term effects, maybe we can have children with less uh, concentration, less scholastic skills. We still do, I think we are still at a stage where we really do not exactly know what will happen maybe two years, three years down the lane. It is difficult to predict, but one thing is sure and certain that there will be an effect. A few educators in schools have begun educating children on the ill effects of using devices and the health advantages of reduced screen time with the hope that the children themselves will choose physical activity and books over screens and devices. That you know that social media in some amount is only needed. So like we have to make sure that we are controlling it. So it's I you, we always say we and stuff like that so that they also understand that we also go through the same thing. So that there is some way that they have the relatability as well. It's not just the students; it's also the adults. It's a constant struggle, you know, because it's been going for a long while. Parents too are being counselled to limit screen time at home, but the going is slow. And constant positive reinforcement and conversations are seen as vital to bring better balance between screens and physical activity, even as a learning tool. In Mumbai, with Jaseelia K. Arundhati Ramanan. And before we wrap this uh, edition of India Business Saw, we leave you with a sneak peek into our new campaign, Sustainable is Attainable, as we hope to achieve a greener future for our children. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.